<laughs> Speaking of Courage Podcast. What's up, everybody? What's, What's up, Chase? On? Not a whole lot, just cold. Chase just threw his back out being a hero on the side of the road <laughs> on his way over here. Yeah. Tried to help a dumb kid push his car after he hydro- <laughs> hydroplane. I, uh, after helping him push for a little while and not get anywhere, he realized his parking brake was on. Even though I already asked him, is your parking brake on? Yeah. But yeah, so I'm uh, going to be tight, <laughs> you a, little, tight a little bit. Nah, he was a dumb kid. <laughs> you could tell he was head messed up and he's going to pay for it later. Yeah. Scared of his parents? Yeah. And yeah, you had definitely. actually wrecked in the same place, right? Yeah, Kyle. My, fr- <laughs> my friend Kyle and I crashed a uh, rented car there <laughs> a long, long time ago. Broke the axle. Good and uh, good and good and broke, screwing around. So it was like a flashback. You felt sorry for him. Yeah, it was a <laughs> it was a glimpse of my past. But he was alone. He had no Kyle with him. Okay, where are we headed today, man? All right. So this is actually going to be uh, the story of Tybor Rubin, and this Tybor. is going to span two two wars: uh, World War II and Korea. He went to both. Well, he was a civilian in one, and he was a soldier in another. So Interesting. Tybor was a uh, Jewish. Hungarian, born in 1929 in the small village of uh, Pastel, Hungary. So you can kind of see where this is going already, yeah. right? So born in 1929, if you know anything about, we've talked extensively about World War II on this channel. Yeah. We've talked about what was going on in America and other parts of the world with the Depression. But in Europe, it was much, much worse what was going on. Yeah. Right? So the, um, the rise of, of Nazism and fascism and all those things in the early 1930s, that's what Tybor grew up with. And uh, being of Jewish ancestry, that obviously had a great effect on his life. Dang. So what, what is he going through as a child there? Yeah, so he was born, like I said, in Pastau. He's, um, he had a good life. Uh, he said he had a good loving family, good, good community when he was first starting to grow up. He had, I believe, three, three sisters, an older brother we looked up to, and then a, a, a half-brother or a stepbrother. His dad was actually a war hero. Um, he was served in the Hungarian army in World War I, and he was a POW. He was a prisoner of war for six really? years. His twin brother was a POW as well, and he was uh, executed by the Russians for, for getting caught stealing food, yeah. which is going to kind of play into Tybor's, Tybor's life a bit later. So his early life is normal. So in his early, early years, he has a good life, at least as, as far as he knows. His dad, and then how fast does it switch? Well, by the, when he starts getting to the age of... Um, in, in Jewish tradition, the age of manhood, about 13 years old is yeah. when, his, when his world kind of falls apart there. Um, Hungary is an ally to Nazi Germany. Um, like I said, his dad was a, a practicing, very religious Jew. He went through a, a lot in his life. He came home. Um, when he came home from the war, his father, he, his wife had left him. She was living with someone else, you know, so he had to kind of restart his life. Tybor's mother died when he was very young. She had cancer and he died. And then uh, his father remarried to his stepmother, who he, who he loved very much. She was a good woman. So yeah. his dad was a shoemaker, so he grew up in that Jewish tradition, you know, going to the Jewish schools and everything, uh, Hebrew school. He would work uh, with the goats and work with the animals, but he had a good, loving, caring family. As time moved on, when he came of age, when he came about 12 or 13, when you have your bar mitzvah in, in yeah. Jewish tradition, you become a man, that's when all these rumblings started. The war started going bad for uh, Nazi Germany and for Hung- Hungary. The Hungarian troops were not doing well, fighting on the Eastern Front, and um, all these rumors started swirling and stuff. But because of where they were, they were untouched by some of the, some of the larger things that were going on. So in Nazi Germany, in Poland, in Austria, in Czechoslovakia, and all these Nazi-occupied places, the Jews started getting slowly stripped of their rights, right? It wasn't just How this, slow was it? Well, it started off slow, and then with the bang, there's a thing called Kristallnacht where they came through and smashed the windows of all the synagogues and things. But um, it was a, a slow escalation. Jews weren't allowed to um, hold certain jobs. Jews weren't allowed to marry. There were, there were acts that were passed. Jews weren't allowed to marry non-Jews. Um, Jews weren't allowed to work in certain places. Then they started to have to wear the stars in certain places. They weren't allowed to go be out after night. They weren't allowed to own radios. This slow progression. Then they started being herded into these um, ghettos, and they started being forced into this labor. And uh, his brother was uh, lived in Budapest. He started being forced into these work crews, and they're, you know, oh, well, it's to support the war, they would say, you know, you need to just be good. And a lot of these guys, rather than seeing the writing on the wall because they didn't want to believe it, they kept thinking, well, just do this little bit and we'll get by. Just do this little bit and get by. So there was this encroachment on their rights, and then it became more and more so severe. So if you're a Jewish boy at 13, what, or you're a Jewish anybody at this time, what are you thinking as far as where this is going? You obviously don't see where it's going. 
a lot, it, well, depending on where you were and what you were, your station in life, it would be very different. A lot of the guys in the countryside, they're looking at these as rumors, you know, like this, this isn't, it can't be as bad as they say. And then other people are knowing, yeah, this is, this is the end. We need to get the hell out of here. And they're trying to get across borders and they're trying to get their families out and they're trying to get on ships and go to different countries. And were they looked at as like conspiracy theorists and stuff at first? Like the uh, by the other that Jews, took it very serious. Initially, yeah. some of the other Jews were, yeah, you know, just you know, what are you talking about? Relax. This is all bullshit. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, man. So, but a terrifying, terrifying time. It's this, this, this lingering cloud that's overhead, and and as the noose tightens, you know, as the war progresses and stuff, there's nowhere to go. Early on, if it was the early 1930s, you could get out of there. But you know, later on, and especially when the war started, where are you going to go? Yeah. Um, have you ever seen Casablanca? I don't know why I'm even asking I, you. Why that. do you ask? Me <laughs> that? I don't. I don't know. <laughs> the answer to any movie that I've ever seen. No. <laughs> One of the greatest movies of all time, but that's what they're, they're all refugees that are, are in Casablanca in Northern Africa trying to get out of Nazi held Europe. They're trying yeah. to escape and get their visas and stuff and to get out. But obviously, uh, Tibor's family wasn't in that situation. They were in Hungary. So for a while, as far as he knows, when he's 9, 10, 11 years old, things are just basically normal. You know, times are rough, but he doesn't understand this, this evil that's on the horizon. And then as he gets a little older, they start hearing rumors, you know, that some of the Jews on the border are getting, getting captured by the Gestapo and they're coming around and they're, they're um, disappearing, basically. People are going away. That had to be so terrifying. Oh, God. There's, you can't think of anything yeah. worse. Um, they, they're, Tiber starts seeing people in his town they're Jewish refugees from, from Germany and from Poland, and they're on the run, basically. And he's seeing these guys, and he's like, what the hell is going on? Who are these people? They're just kind of filtering through town in rags, and everybody's starting to shut their doors and be afraid and stuff. And, um, and then when he is about 13, he comes home one day, and he sees there's these seven guys sitting at his kitchen table, and he doesn't know who they are. And initially, his parents tell him, these are your cousins from America. And Tibor loves America. He's obsessed with America. I'm sorry, Tibor. Yeah. Uh, he's obsessed with America because he watches American movies and he wants to go to America. That's yeah. kind of his goal in life. And then he quickly realizes, like, these aren't Americans. These guys are wearing ragged-ass clothes and they look like shit. And that, right. So, and he can't understand them. They don't speak English, but, but he neither does he, but they also don't speak Hungarian. And it turns out they're Polish refugees. So what, ended, what actually happens is his parents knew what was going on. They want to get their sons out of there because they don't want them to get forced into either the military or labor or something to happen to them. So at 13 years old, his parents pack him a bag and they tell him, you're a man, you've had your bar mitzvah, you're going with them. And he says, I don't want to go. And they say, you need to go. And you can just imagine, you know, them not wanting them to tell him. Yeah, but can you imagine the mom, the heartbreak that would be and the dad, and not saying, listen to us or they'll kill you. Just saying, trying to say it's okay. Yeah, they're trying to get them out of there. So what the plan is, is these refugees are going to go. They're trying to get to Switzerland because it's a neutral country and they think they'll be protected there from the Nazis. So they're going to walk from Hungary to Switzerland to get to the border. They're going to hide on the way, and they're going to try to get there so they don't get rounded up. So Tibor, 13 years old, his mom packs him a bag, kisses him on the head and his dad, you know, and they tell him, just go with them. Just do what they say. And he can't even communicate with them. He doesn't speak their language. He doesn't know them. And he quickly recognizes these are city guys. He's a country kid. Can you imagine how terrifying yeah, that would be? Yeah. And then his, like I said, he's grown up religious. He doesn't necessarily, he's not devout himself, but his dad is. And they have the prayers every night and they do the holidays. So he wants his prayer book. And they tell him, no, they snap at him. No, you can't have your prayer book. And he's not understanding if they if he's found with that on him, he's done. Yeah. So that's, that's the severity of the situation. So eventually his parents force him to go with these guys. So he stops counting at about 10 days. They're walking. They're just walking. This 13-year-old kid with these grown men that he can't communicate with. They walk at night, and during the day they hide. They'll sleep in the woods and cover themselves in branches and stuff so no one will find them because you, you're not just afraid of the Gestapo or the SS or the German troops. You're afraid of other civilians and other citizens that yeah. hate you that are going to turn you in, you know, think like Anne Frank and stuff. Yeah. So they're still trying to make it their way closer and closer to... Um, the Swiss border, I'm sorry, the uh, border of Switzerland. And um, like I said, these guys, he realizes they're not, they're not these, these mountain men or these, these capable people. They're city people. They're engineers. They can navigate by the stars. They're very intelligent, but they don't know how to live in the country like he does. So as a 13-year-old kid, he becomes their kind of savior. As they're walking, he sneaks into these farms and stuff. So every time they pass a farm, he runs in and he'll steal food and he fills his pockets and he fills his pants with them. And then he runs back and gives it to them. So then they're kind of like, wow, we, we really need this yeah. kid. So after a couple of weeks of walking, they make it to the border. And as they see the, they see the barbed wire, they see everything, 
They go to cross. They wait, they wait for nightfall. They go to cross. As soon as they get in that no man's land, the spotlights hit them. And then a German uh, patrol comes up. Ugh. And then he's uh, taken to Mauthausen concentration camp. So as a 13-year-old as a, thirteen, as a boy, he's, he's, he's driven to one of the most infamous, infamous concentration camps in, in the Nazi-occupied Europe. And he still has no idea what the hell's going on, probably. Not, not I mean, a good maybe idea. a small idea. Yeah, he but... actually had said in one interview that he was relieved when they got to the gates because the, the car ride was so uncomfortable. So he's like, oh, cool, I finally get to rest, not knowing what, what this um, whore that was going to be awaiting him when he got there. Man. And I don't need to recap the whole um, history of the Holocaust, but any, any evils that you can imagine are going are gonna to be there. Yeah. As, as soon as Tybor gets in the camp, he's, you can smell the dead bodies, the rotting flesh. There's bodies stacked high. There's the soot from the ashes. How from deep the are people. we now? It's all, uh, so this these is, concentration this is the end of the camps war. are established. Yeah, the, the concentration camps have been going since the late 1930s, uh, or in some places earlier. This is uh, 1944. It's almost the end of the war. Yeah. Uh, I think Mauthausen was uh, opened in 1939 or something like that, uh, maybe a little bit later. So it's been going for several years. So the guys that are there are survivors of quite yeah. a bit of ordeal. And then there's other guys that are constantly being trucked in. Man, you can only imagine right there. Just stop right there. Yeah. The fear. He's plucked away from his parents. Man, that is terrifying. Yeah, you think about even, that. Even and, without the Holocaust aspect of it, just yeah. a 13-year-old kid just being left to fend for yourself, basically. Go with these guys who you don't know. You just have to trust them. We just have to because it's the lesser of the evils right now. It's the lesser of the dangers. Just kind of go with. and and Or just have that shadowy government type of thing. Oh, yeah. You hear conspiracy theorists all the time. But imagine people are disappearing. You're 13. You don't quite understand what's going on. And there's this Nazi. Right soldiers Just right threat. that are and they can kill you with immunity like yeah. you can't overstate that while he was in mouth there's no protection yeah they're they're stripped they shave their heads you know again this this humiliation um one of the guys he started to be able to communicate with that he was walking with by the name of peter kind of sheltered him and tried to protect him and uh he was able to do so to get him to go to the same barracks as him but they're de they're treated like they're not human beings you know they're stripped of their clothes they're sprayed with the hoses they're dunked in these these de tanks and they're just thrown into these barracks when they get to the barracks it's just a, a mass of humanity in the worst way. Guys sleeping on top of each other, um, you know, these skeletal people, a glimpse of your future, you know, you're yeah. seeing these guys, you're still decently well fed, and these guys are, are skin and bones, guys that should be 160 pounds or 90 pounds, they can't even get up. Guys have sores and lesion on them, there's, there's lice, there's dysentery, there's bed bugs, there's all these kinds of things, not to mention the Germans. He, and there's uh, no humanity. There's no humanity whatsoever. Even some you're of the, even around. some of the other people in the camp are are fighting each other. That's you what know? I mean. So you, as a 13 year old kid, in, in the worst scenarios, you're looking for an adult, right, that will make everything right, right, and the adults make everything yeah, worse. And and well, in, in just human nature, you're looking for some. There's got to be a solution to this, but yeah. there's, there's, there's not. Somebody there's has to have not. humanity, like some yeah. compassion. Right. And it's just nowhere to be found. These guards could literally shoot you with impunity or beat you to death with impunity. Now, are Nothing's all the guards? Just horrific to these people? Uh, I mean, you'll hear occasional stories of people not, but I mean, just by nature of being there for them to survive mentally, they've, they've absorbed that. I don't think you're going to find too many great, great softy stories yeah. on there or anything like that. Man. This is like one of the most fascinating topics for me is that yeah, is this, Nazi Germany. This because, would be a whole other show. Yeah, We've I talked about to, it quite extensively. I would love to do an episode on just like yeah. the, not even the concentration camp stuff, but the lead up to it. Right, and the civilians. I think there's a lot to learn yeah, in that, I gave you that book, uh, that Hitler's Willing Execution. Yeah, there's, there's yeah. some other ones. It's the, the fascinating aspect of it is what, it wasn't all these monsters doing monstrous things. It was normal people that yes. were driven to do evil things and how quickly people can do that and how, how fast that becomes accepted. Yeah. The, banal, I, the banality of evil is what it's called, that, that um, Adolf Eichmann with the... Uh, organization of the concentration camps and things. It wasn't this, you know, oh, I hate the Jews. and I mean, Eichmann didn't give a shit one way or another, but he doesn't care. He's just going with it. It's a system. This is my job and I'm doing it. I heard an interview with Jordan Peterson. He was talking about how people's narcissism always makes them believe <laughs> like, oh, I wouldn't have done that or I right. wouldn't have. Right. And it's like, no, more, more than likely you would be one of the people that went along with it one yeah. way or the other. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's regular well, most people. Most people are weak and most people are cowards. Yeah, and, most uh, people they are They won't sheep. stand up when they need to or have to. So. And then by the time you want to stand up, it's too late. Mm -hmm. And there's also people, I mean, that's the funny thing, not to get political with Antifa and stuff. Like, they, they, they think, yeah, we're this, you know, anti-fascist. Like, no, you are the mob. Yes. And you are doing this. And look how easily you're swept in these things. And then the defenders of that, look how easily you're just 
justifying actions that Against, are atrocious. Yes. When objectively, again, if you like Trump or you hate Trump or you like Biden or you hate Biden, you should both be able to look at something an individual yes. act and say that's horrendous. That's a, when you start justifying one because you're blue or you're red. That's what. That's all this is. I was talking to my brother about this because you've always talked to me about this topic, and um, it is very interesting how when you demonize your opposition, yeah, it justifies everything. Mm-hmm. It's like the Jew, or the Nazis yeah. demonized the Jews, right? And then let, let the whole population do whatever because yeah. it's not they're not human. They're not you know what I mean. And you're seeing a lot of that in this. I mean, not a lot of that, but you're seeing yeah. shades. We of don't want to get too. Political, no, I'm not going to get you, political, but you're seeing shades from both sides, right? And you definitely see it, like, oh, well, fuck them and fuck that. It's like, dude, that's still your cousin or your brother or human <laughs> or being. Or the civil or, war thing. Let's go to sit. You're like, yeah, like really? yeah, yeah. Again, we've talked about yeah. that. Yeah, you you start seeing. Well, Read about the civil war. War war is not <laughs> you playing Call of Duty. War is mothers holding their dead sons. And there's a lot of gray area everything. people yeah, in the yeah, middle yeah, that yeah. you don't. You know what I mean? Like, right. Come on. Yeah. Let's go back to being gray, but. But regardless, this is this is the worst that can happen in humanity. I can't. I mean, it's not hyperbole to say that this was one of the worst times in human history. Yeah. Uh, Rod Serling has a great episode yeah. uh, on the Twilight Zone when he says when a uh, man turned uh, the, the earth into a graveyard, basically. You know, but that's what this thirteen-year-old kid is living with. And he links up with another. There's a ten-year-old kid there named Aaron that kind of starts showing him the ropes. Hey, another kid, look at this. And he know, he's looking at Aaron, and he's like, "This kid's fucking gone. Like he's already crazy because he he's telling him, oh, yeah, wait till we get to the um the the gravel pits where they have to break rocks because Mouthhausen is a death by labor camp. They're they're forced into work, and he's like, yeah, wait till you see him parachute, and he doesn't know what that is. Um, one day they're in the square, and uh, again, as a 13-year-old kid, they, the Nazis hanged a man that, you know, by the neck, and he's sitting there watching that, and this is becoming this, this normal thing. They would say that when they'd, they'd wake up in the morning and they would have to go to roll call, and then you know, they'd get sent to their various work camps, and then at night, sometimes you'd wake up and the guy next to you is just dead, and some guys, sometimes they'd just be too tired to do anything about it, so they'd just be laying there with the dead bodies and stuff. Um, as soon as he got to camp, he got dysentery real bad, you know? Yeah. He's shitting all over himself. Again, imagine that without medicine and being yeah. able to have your mom go. But he's in the, he's in the worst hive of humanity. But the, the, the block leader in the camp starts, decides to help him. Um, and he, he gets some charcoal out of a fire and he has him eat this charcoal so it'll settle his stomach. So, you know, Damn. these are the kinds of things they're having to come up with. Um, those engineers that he was with, they kind of protected him, though. So they are very intelligent people. They're college educated. Again, it's funny. They, they should be, you know, wealthy people in society. But because of the government they're under, they're looked at as less than human. But they convinced the Germans, hey, we can get this labor camp built for you outside because they're bringing in more and more prisoners. So they ended up getting to go for a couple of months outside the camp. They get to live outside the camp and um, work on this, this thing. And they, they convince the Germans, hey, Tybor is our assistant. So he gets to go with them. So he gets a oh, little bit of cool. a reprieve from this. Excuse me. So while they're out in the woods, you know, they're freezing and they're, they're, they're working by day and they're sleeping by night. The, he, um, the other guys that are with him, they notice that the Germans are eating good and they're throwing their food in the trash. And like once every couple of days, they light it on fire to burn it. But for those couple of days, it's not there. So they build Tybor this little like enclosure in a, wood sh- in a wood pile and they have him hide in there. And then at night he sneaks out and he steals the food. So again, he's stealing that food nice. like he was on the walk. And he, he looks at himself as a rat. He calls himself as a camp rat. Yeah. And he doesn't think of that negatively. He thinks rats are smart and they can survive. Yeah. So that's kind of what he embodies to himself. So he starts actually like tightening his cuffs on his pants of his legs and his, and his bar arms and just shoving food in there and walking like a doughboy and getting away. If he got caught, they'd kill him yeah. for sure. doesn't matter that he's 13. doesn't matter that they're starving. But he ends up doing this and he does it for, for months. Um, at the end of it, they're all sent back to the camp, though. So they go back to Mauthausen, and Aaron's gone. Aaron's dead. Um, a lot of the other guys that were in the camp are gone, you know, just by attrition, execution, or suicide. A lot of these guys Jeez. are killing themselves. And he said the camp was just much worse by then. The bodies were stacked, you know, body uh, shoulder high outside the barracks where people are just throwing them because they're, they're just done with them. Um, Aaron had told him a story before he got there of uh, when they brought in some Russian soldiers the Russian soldiers were put into the uh, middle of the, the square to do their, their count and everything, and the, they took the healthy ones and sent them to work, and the ones that were too sick or, sick or wounded, they, it was the dead of winter, and they were you know, stripped down to almost nothing, and the Germans sprayed them with fire hoses so they would freeze and just left them there to die, and oh, then they carted man. off the chunks of ice and body Gosh. and just let it rot. So this is the kind of stuff that's going on in this hellacious, hellacious camp. Damn, there's some sadistic stuff that went on, bro. Jesus. <laughs> you, and it, you, Imagine that. It doesn't take long for human beings to come up with horrible ways to treat each other. Ugh. Man. Can you imagine being ice cold and then you get f- 
sprayed with cold water too. Yeah, I mean, Dude, I, I, hate, and knowing I hate the cold. And you're not getting any compassion from your from your. From and your can you imagine captor. the guys that survive this? Like, why would you even want to survive at some point? That's what I mean. There's, yeah, have you ever heard of Viktor Frankl? Uh-uh. Uh, he developed logotherapy. I think it's pronounced. He's a psychiatrist. Um, but he was a or psychologist. I'm sorry, uh, he is a survivor of Auschwitz, and um, he uh, may, you have to develop your why basically to, to give yeah. you a reason to survive. If you don't, you'll just die. But one of the things I found interesting in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, was um, two two of the things that that stuck out to me. They had two role or two of the roles they had were if someone's trying to kill themselves, you can't stop them. It's morally you're morally obligated not to stop them because that's their right. Yeah. And the other is if someone's having a nightmare, you let them. You don't wake them up because whatever they're dreaming about isn't as bad as the reality Jesus. of what they're in. Uh, and that always stuck with me is just just you know horrific. Ugh. So just one more story of of the hor- hor- horrors of Nazi Germany. So the um, the parachuting I was talking about, he finally saw what that was when he went to what was called the pit, and they have all these these you know slaves basically slave labor down there these these jewish and and it wasn't just jews these are you know homosexuals and um uh, gypsies and poles and russian soldiers and just anybody that was contrary to the regime but they're in there toiling away and for a game the germans took the two smallest looking guys and they put big rocks on their back and they made them race and as they're racing the one guy when he lost the german just took a pickaxe and hit him in the head and killed him with it and then he just heaved his body into the pit and basically yelled parachute like they're parachuting down so Jeez. yeah tybor turned 14 in the camp so he went from 13 to 14 and one uh, random day a new group of bodies came in and one of them was his older brother emery so oh, a small shit. piece of hope you know his brother kind of was able to shield him and protect him for the end um he ended up spending 14 months in the camp and uh, right before the war, the war ended May 1945 in Europe, around May uh, 4th through 6th, the uh, American troops of the 11th Armored Division stormed through the gates and their tanks and everything, you know, and here are these sick, you know, people who've been in the worst that humanity has to offer, and they're seeing these Americans, you know, that are big and strong, and they have their tanks, and they have their equipment, and they're, you know, they're coming through victorious, and they, they rescued them, and they treated them so well, and Tabor never forgot how he was treated. And he said, he made an oath to himself that if I ever get the chance, I'm going to go to America and I'm going to become a G.I. Joe. I'm going to repay <laughs> this debt that I owe because he, he looked at that as the Americans basically saved yeah, his you, life. Yeah, you wonder why people look at this country like they do. Think about that, dude. Think about being in, in that yeah. living hell and seeing that tank come through those gates mm-hmm. and just... If we weren't... 14 months, he's, he's Who does that, that if this country's not here? You know what <laughs> right, I mean? Yeah. Damn. That was yeah. a heavy little. Uh, yeah, so we're visual. not even we're not even there yet, man. We're we're still we're still going. Um, so yeah, so Tybor after they're liberated from the camps, um, there's a great scene in Schindler's List again. Have you seen Schindler's List? Yes. Okay, you've at least seen. Schindler's yes. List. When all the Jews are sitting outside Many the times. camp and the Russian soldier comes up on horseback, and they say, "Where do we go?" And he says, "Don't go that way. They hate you there. Don't yeah. go that way either. They hate you there too. Like there's nowhere to go." So Tybor. And his brother, they went back uh, to their hometown of Pasto, and they found their sister, and someone's living in their house, basically. And they're like, get out of our house. And they're like, no, go see the mayor, basically. So these people took over their homes, and they took over what was going on. And then this ended up being, their area ended up being occupied by the Soviets, by the Soviet soldiers. So they're trying to, all these displaced people are trying to get word of what happened to their family. And they lost cousins and uncles. And, and you know, you're just, you're just hearing word. Has anyone heard from so-and-so? And then you're, you're finally finding out that that, no that, internet, no, that person you know I mean? died. In Mauthausen alone, they have records that 90,000 people died, but it's probably closer to 200,000 people died in about five years. In the Holocaust, they say 11 million people died, six or seven million Jews, and then five million plus non-Jews. So every, it's not just, oh, somebody knows someone that died. It's literally like half your family's wiped away. So he ends up finding out what happened to his parents and his little sister. He loved his little sister very much, his baby sister that he looked at, you know, like the baby of the family. Um, His dad... Because he was a war hero, some of the Hungarians tried to protect him. They said, Try, you know, you can get out, just take this pass, and you can send for your family later. But he wouldn't leave his family because he knew that that wasn't going to happen. Yeah. So his dad ended up getting sent to Auschwitz, and his, his, um, his uh, wife and daughter, which is Tiber's uh, stepmom and his, and his little sister. Have you ever heard of Joseph Mengele, the angel of death? Yes. Yeah, so Mengele, yeah. one of the things exactly, when, they, when the people would come into the camps, he would have a classical music playing, and he would send his baton or his swagger stick left or right, and it was either left to labor and live or right straight to the gas chamber. So when they got to his mom, they said left to live, and his little sister right to, to die, basically. And uh, she wouldn't leave her, so she knew what was going on, so she handed off her coat, and she went with her daughter, and she died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, Tybar's little sister, his baby sister, and his, mo- his mother were gassed upon Oof. arrival. 
And then uh, his, his dad ended up dying. And again, all these uncles and stuff. So they have nowhere to go. They're, they're back in Pasto. And they're, his sister, they find another place to live. Um, one of their other friends, she, they find her. And she's basically says, my whole family's dead. I'm leaving. Here's my keys to my house. So they live there. And Tybor comes home one day. And there's a Russian soldier trying to rape his sister. And uh, he hits him on the head with the vase. And they're, you know, it's just, it's just horrible. So they end up uh, going to a camp for displaced persons, and they stay there. And they're, the whole family's trying to figure out what to do. His older brothers want to go to Palestine, which ends up being coming in Israel, other places. People are trying to go places. One of his sister ends up getting married and moving off. But Tybor is obsessed with America. Yeah. So just to cut to the chase, uh, by 1950, he ends up getting sponsored by a um, charity group, and they pay for his way to go to America. So he gets on a ship. By now, he's um, about 20 years old, I believe. Yeah. And uh, he goes to America. Um, sails into the harbor in New York. He says he's, you know, he's super stoked. To, and then they see, he saw this New York skyline and he realized, holy shit, like I'm in over my head. He actually had his suitcase clo- full of clothes and they were so threadborn and, you know, European and nasty that he just dumped them over the side of the ship. He said, I can never be in America with these. And then when he got there, he realized I probably shouldn't have done that. I, yeah. need, I needed <laughs> those. I needed those clothes. Um, but, um, he ends up in America. He ends up uh, in New York initially in 1948 is is uh, is where he gets, and he, when he's of age, he he tries to join the army, just like he said he was going to do. He first um, he gets a job in a butcher shop, even though it's not kosher. He gets a job uh, trying to work as a shoemaker. He gets a job as a cashier, and he loves America. He meets one of his distant relatives who was actually uh, uh, lived in New York and was a submariner during the war. So he's kind of his hero. So he's looking up to him, but he's, he kind of gets settled. He loves America. He's he's hearing more and more about what's going on back in his home country. And he hates the Soviet Union. He hates the communists. He hates yeah. what they're doing to this land because he's seeing it firsthand, you know, and he's hearing about it. When he's, I'm sorry, when he's 19 years old, he tries to join the army, just like he said he was going to. But his English is so horrific that they pretty much, he fails his test miserably. You know, you can't take it. Come back in six months. So he takes the test again in six months, and he fails horrifically because his English is... Like, you, would, you and I wouldn't even be able to understand him without yeah. subtitles at this point. He's, he's lived his whole life in, in Hungary. His whole formative years were in a concentration camp, basically. Or his formative year, the most formative year of his life. And now he's trying to adapt. But he, he does pretty well for himself in New York. He's, he's living the good life. But his family starts moving on. You know, hey, we're, we've been through this hell of this life. Let's just be happy. And he says, no, I got to repay my debt. I got to go... I got to become a GI Joe, like I said I was going to do. I'm going to repay this country that I love, and I'm going to become a soldier. So eventually, he ends up taking a train to Oakland. He's going to go visit someone out there, and he figures I'll try to join the army over there. So as he takes the train across the country, he kind of gets to see Middle America, and he gets to see the United States, this country that he loves, and he realizes how beautiful it is, and he just feels so lucky to be an American, you know, and to yeah. be a part of this country. And he just can't get it out of his head. I want to repay this country. When he gets to uh, Oakland, San Francisco area, he goes to join again. And as he's sitting there in the waiting room, the sergeant and the, uh, says, like, you know, you're, you talk real funny, kid. Like, wh- yeah. why the hell do you want to join the army? And he tells him, I, was, I survived the Holocaust. I survived, you know, this horrible upbringing in this country saved my life, and I want to give it to him. So the sergeants start talking to each other, and they go, listen, you got to go take the test right now. There's a guy in there that just got out of the Navy, and he's coming over to the Army, and the other one's a Marine. We're going to put you in between them. He goes, we're not telling you to cheat, but watch out for the other guys in the room and just kind of look over at their paper. So yeah. basically, they set him up so he can pass this test. So he does. He cheats <laughs> off the test, and uh, he ends up getting the highest score in the, <laughs> score in the room. <laughs> they tell him, like, you're a genius. We're going to send you to labor camp, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, intelligence school. And yeah. then they realize, oh, he's not as smart as we thought right. he was. So he ends up joining the Army. Uh, he gets in. He becomes uh, an enlisted man. He becomes an infantryman, just like most of our guys do. And uh, he does his basic training, and then he's sent over to Okinawa for uh, advanced infantry training. So now we're kind of lockstep with uh, where most of our guys are at. Yeah. Just unlike most people in this country who have served their countries, whether, you know, at a basic level or a Medal of Honor, most of them haven't gone through what Tybor has already gone through. Not even close. Not even close. So, yeah, in the spring of 1950, he goes from uh, Fort Ord, and then he goes to Okinawa, and he loves the Army. You know, some people are struggling, but he's like, I got clean clothes. I got three meals a day. He's in Okinawa. He's going around. You know, he's meeting girls and stuff. Yeah, I've got all these people. And, of course, he ends up in units that are all hillbillies. They're all Southerners and stuff like that. But he thinks it's funny. Yeah, Yeah, he likes it. They like him. They think he's he's hilarious. Um, But they don't even... 
in this time in this country in 1950, a lot of these guys hadn't even met a Jew because they're from the South, you know? Yeah. So they're asking him about his culture and stuff, and he's telling him, but he's a hilarious guy. He's just got a quick sense of humor, and, you know, they're like, do you, do you believe in Jesus, though? Like, yeah. isn't, isn't Jesus your Savior? And he told one of them, uh, he says, no, I don't, I don't think so. He says, he couldn't even save himself, so I don't think he could save me very <laughs> well, you know? So they don't, they don't quite know what to think of him, but he's a good soldier, so they like him. Yeah. Um, he ends up in the uh, 1st Cavalry Division, which is my unit. Actually, I got my patch on right there. Yeah. Um, so when the Korean War breaks out, he's in Okinawa. Remember, we've talked about this extensively, these troops over there that are kind of living the good life. Yes. So Tybor's not a citizen. So one of his commanders actually gives him the option, though. Hey, we're going, there's a war on now, because these are going to be the first troops over there. Um, this is in uh, uh, July of 1950, I believe. There's going to be a war, and a lot of us are going to die. They're like, you, we'll, we'll give you the chance you can go to Germany or Japan, you know, because you're not even a citizen. You don't need to go with us. And he says, I'm not leaving my guys. I want to be a soldier. I owe this country. So he ends up shipping over with the 1st uh, Cavalry Division. And unlike all those troops that we just talked about, he gets linked up with this 1st Sergeant, the 1st Sergeant of the company. Uh, I'm not going to mention his name, but he was actually a World War II vet and a Korea vet, and he is a hardened, racist, anti-Semite, and he hates... Tybar with a passion. He pretty much makes it well known to everybody as soon as he meets his unit, you know. I don't have time for fuck for any of that shit. Yeah. So Tybor's looking around like, what the hell is this? And uh, some of the other guys that like him, they tell him, hey, watch out for him. He's a real redneck. And uh, these are other Southerners saying yeah. this, you know. Tybor doesn't even know what a redneck is. He thought that many was an Indian. So <laughs> he's like, because he's from Hungary, you know. Yeah. So, But what they're telling him is watch out for this guy. And this sergeant, he ends up basically trying to get Tybor killed. So he hates him. He calls him, uh, he calls him a, that funny son of a bitch Jew. Like he won't, he refuses to even see him as a human being. He thinks he's trash. He told the company, you won't find any Jews over here because they're all at home counting their money. They're not fighting with us, you know? And uh, Tybor's like, I'm right here. What are you talking about? You yeah. Know? There were other guys that were buddies with Tybor that started getting selected for, for bullshit details and stuff just by association. So this guy's basically An asshole. a degenerate piece of shit. And he's, yeah. he's going out of his way to make Tybor's life a living hell. So the 1st Cavalry Division, Tybor included, 8th Cav, that was my unit when I got out, actually. I was uh, 9th Cavalry and then 8th Cavalry before I discharged. They get sent to uh, Pohang Dong in July 18th, 1950. So this is where we've talked about that, the Korean War, this war we were unprepared for. A lot of guys thought we were going to get over there, we were going to smash them, we were going to go home. Little did they realize... Um, when they landed, our, our troops were, the, the troops that landed at uh, Pohang Dong, they were 10,000 man strong. They had 2,000 vehicles, but they should have been 15,000 man strong. They were extremely undermanned. They didn't realize that there was a huge North Korean force 25 miles east of them, just waiting, waiting to fight, basically. Yeah. It's July. Um, there's been a drought on. There's no water. Everybody's just, you know, choking. They are thinking, we're going to traipse through this police action, and then they just got slammed soon as they landed, they could hear the distant artillery, and it's kind of making guys uneasy, you know, like, what the hell's going on? These are all these North Korean troops that have come through and smashed the South Koreans. They broke through that line. This is the communist troops that are trying to occupy the country. And again, this isn't, um, you know, a local uprising or anything. This is a foreign invasion. Yeah, it's both called Korea, but the South Koreans don't want these people here. The North Koreans invade this country, and they're trying to force their will on them. Yeah. And then uh, as part of the UN first major action, uh, uh, the United Nations decided we're going to stop this. So they end up being uh, the ones that are there. Tybor's unit, they get in some sporadic firefights and they kind of start seeing what they're dealing with. You know, they're in South Korea, they're seeing this mountains, they're seeing this drought, they're marching along and they're realizing every firefight they get into, this war is not going to be as easy as, as they said. Um, they're realizing how advanced the enemy is, how big of equipment they have, how much of a steamroller they are. In the first 10 days, the first Cav lost 5,000 men the first 10 days Damn. of the Korean War, of their action in there. And, and Tybor's part of this unit, right? But he's probably... I mean, of course you're affected, but he's been through this, right? Exactly. So he hasn't been through the combat, but to him, this is just another part of right. his life. He's used to death. He's been used to death since he was a small child. And he doesn't feel, and I think the, the difference would be when you're in those concentration camps, you are the victim. Right. You, you are defenseless. And now he's got a rifle. And he now he's got a rifle. So at least you can do something. Yeah. You know very, what I mean? Very true. So they get, um, they're pushing forward and then they start 
having to fall back. They end up falling back to what's called the Pusan perimeter. Again, we tried to, we we're going to go push them forth, but we, we had to fall back to this little part of the peninsula just to kind of try to hold our ground. And it's just chaos everywhere. The guys that don't have enough equipment, they don't have experience, and they're, they're seeing these waves and waves of human body. The Koreans are the, the, and the Chinese are the ones that are notorious, like we've talked about. They're blowing the bugle and yeah, rattling yeah. things to be Screaming terrifying the and then all these bodies. They end up on the uh, Pusan perimeter one night, and they're, they're out there. They don't know what's going on. You know, you're scared and you're terrified. And some civilians come through, some refugees, and they get the order, let them through. They're South Koreans. And then later in the night, the, the, they start hearing explosions behind them. The guys they let through were basically you know, infiltrators. Oh, so they shit. start, they take over a machine gun, and they start firing down into Tybor's position and his friend's position. There's ammo dumps blowing up. Guys that were sleeping in their foxholes are getting bayoneted. They're having trouble shooting back because you're shooting uphill now, and your friends are mixed in there. So these are the kinds of things he's seeing, you know. Yeah. This is the kind of stuff he's experiencing. His first sergeant, Peyton, I wasn't going to say his name, but there it is, Yeah, <laughs> who hates him. Every time there's a volunteer or every time they need a volunteer for a difficult mission or scouting or something like that, he sends Tybor. Send me that funny son of a bitch Jew up here. So he's basically not necessarily overtly trying to get him killed, but if somebody's got to go, just send Tybor. Yeah. So he's getting more and more experience and he's getting more and more of this, this combat. And he's also being abused, basically. I need some guys to go scout that ridge. I, they, somebody might die. Send Tybor. I need somebody to go cl- haul that off. Send Tybor. I need someone for guard Which is duty, probably Tybor. hilarious because Tybor's probably looking at him like, dude. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> You're like a weenie compared yeah, to what I faced. exactly. But at the same time. <laughs> but still sucks. But unfortunately, because this guy was a badass, he wasn't a pussy. Yeah. He, he was a badass in World War II and he'd been a badass so far. All the other guys looked up to him too. So you got to. He had yeah, balls. He, yeah. And you, you got to. You're being back into that. What, regardless of what you've been through, you're in a fight for your life now, yeah. and you can't rely on people around you because they are afraid of what he's going to do. So it's, it makes for a very shitty um, environment. Yeah. You know, you can get through anything if you have people with you, but if everybody else is shunning you, it, it becomes much, much, much very more lonely difficult. really quick. Yeah. So um, with the Pusan perimeter, like we were talking about, they ended up pulling back, and the general of the 1st Cavalry Division ordered a stand-or-die order, basically. We shall not retreat anymore. If we fall back, we are completely done. We need to get back to this line in the sand, and we need to stand our ground. Nobody can give any ground or we're done for. The, the casualties are going to be atrocious. We're not going to be able to take this back. We're not going to be able to do another landing at this time. We don't have the troops. There's nobody coming. It's up to us. We need to hold this ground. We need to fall back to these positions, right? So they're advanced to that position, the 8th Cav, where they are right now. So they get the order, hey, we need to fall back, but we have this huge ammo cache. We need to leave some people behind. So guess who the uh, first sergeant says? Yeah, so he says, Tybor, you're staying back. We're going, right? So uh, this was... That's basically a death order, right? Yeah, 23 July 1950. Tybor's by himself, basically. There's a huge ammo dump. I wanted some of the guys that like him come up and they tell him, we'll be back in a few hours, Tybor. We're, we're not going to leave you here. We'll be back in a few hours. So he's going, shit, I'm by myself with all this ammo. And he's literally on a mountainside. The whole 8th Cav is retreating. Everybody's falling back. It's just a scramble for cover, basically, right? Guys are hitching rides wherever they can. Guys are running. Guys are, you know, you're terrified. You're shoving grenades in your pocket. The end is near if these guys get through. And Tybor's Why left would they alone leave on one this person? mountainside. Well, they, sh- they weren't supposed to leave one person. They were supposed to leave like a platoon, a rear guard yeah. action. But Tybor, or this first sergeant didn't tell the higher. He just, I got it. I'll, le- I- I'll take care Damn, of it. Damn, so he hated him that much. And then he leaves Tybor by himself. Damn. So Tybor's kind of naive and foolish. Um, he looks around. He sees the ammo dump. He finds some food. So he's like, sweet. So he starts opening all the, uh, egg, the K rations and everything. He finds some Butterfinger candies, and he's eating his candy and stuff. And he's, yeah. he's kind of hoping, God, I hope they come back soon, right? As the hours start ticking by and it starts to get to, to nightfall, he realizes they're not coming back. And uh, so he's, there's all these, these foxholes that are unmanned now that they were um, uh, supposed to be, you know, have a whole platoon of guys in. So he realizes, if I'm going to survive this, I better do something. So he goes to that ammo cache, and he grabs machine guns and rifles and ammo, and he starts filling these pits. He starts putting rifles in each of them and clips uh, for the M1 Garands and uh, magazines for the carbines and, yeah. and grenades and mortars and everything. He starts filling them all up, and then he's watching... He's watching the clock tick. You know, he's looking at his watch and he's thinking, "God, I hope they come back." And, they, and he, there's there's no more sounds of trucks. There's no more sounds of anything. And it's a it's a pitch black night. The moon's behind the clouds. And you know, as it gets closer and closer, he's starting to get more and more terrified because 
you know, if you've ever went camping or anything and you yeah. look out into the woods and you start to see things move, he's starting to see things everywhere and he's starting to hear things and he's the only one there. So the only thing he can hear is the sound of himself praying because he's starting to get scared. So yeah. he's saying his, his prayers in Hebrew. He said he uh, prayed to God. He prayed to Buddha. He prayed to Jesus. <laughs> he prayed to anybody that would help him just to, just, you know, let, let, let this be a false alarm. Let me get out of here. Where are these guys? When is somebody going to come help me? And then, um, about four in the morning, the moon kind of comes behind the clouds and he looks down and he sees the whole valley's moving below him. So there's, there's oh, a whole shit. North Korean advance that's coming after him, basically. So he goes into action. He says that he was terrified, but he had to keep going. He didn't know what to do. His body just kind of took over. So he immediately jumps on the machine gun and he just starts firing into these waves and waves of bodies. And some places he can't even see these guys. He's just hearing screams and he's directing his machine gun fire at him. Fortunately for him, the Koreans were under equipped, so sometimes what they would do is they would have certain ways with rifles, certain ways with grenades, certain ways without anything that would pick things up. And to save their ammunition, a lot of times they wouldn't fire until they had someone in their sight. So it wasn't a suppressive fire thing, so they're lobbing grenades. So they're looking for bodies, but they're not seeing anyone because he's this phantom. So what he ended up doing was he would move from foxhole to foxhole, and he's sprinting as hard as he can. They start firing artillery at him. The whole mountainside is shaking. He's feeling this, this shaking. He's getting knocked down by concussions, yeah. but he's firing into these crowds. He's hearing the screams. He's firing his machine gun. And as, as the, um, they start to overwhelm, he sprints to another one. He'll crawl to another one. He'll throw grenades. He had uh, handfuls of grenades. He would just pull the pin, throw, pull the pin, throw, pull the pin, throw, not even looking, not even knowing if he's hitting anybody. The only way he could tell he was hitting anybody was by the screams that he was hearing of people going yeah. down. So Tybor ends up moving and moving. Um, he said he fired until his hands were shaking. He's overcome with emotion, just like we've talked about with athletes and stuff. He's having these adrenaline dumps. He ended up holding this hill by himself for 24 hours. 24 hours, Tybor fought off an entire uh, North Korean advance. Through the day and everything? Through the, through the entire night and into that morning. When the morning finally came, when that sun finally rose, the, the valley was littered with bodies, basically, for to include the time he was left before the battle started. It was a 24-hour position. While he was holding this, was, this was the only road that was open for all of our troops to get back to the perimeter. Had he had this position fell and those troops funneled through, they would have been able to slaughter our guys. But Tybor by himself was firing machine gun, firing M1 Grand, firing carbines, Jesus. firing grenades. He's getting hit with everything that they have, and he's holding his ground. When the sun comes up, he finally looks up and he sees American planes. The Corsairs come over and they start diving into the valley and they start slaughtering these guys as well. And again, just like we've talked about, he has that, that um, adrenaline dump. He sits there and he starts crying and he starts shaking and he realizes, you know, kind of what he's done. After he heard that bugle to start, from when he heard that bugle at four in the morning to when he was finally relieved, there was, there was no point in time when he wasn't firing, when he wasn't holding down that trigger, pulling grenades or slamming something like that. And because he had that high ground position and they couldn't see him, they're firing sporadically, expecting there to be you know, 30 to 100 guys up there, but there's just one guy and he was able to, to hold that advance Jesus. off and fire until he was empty. He was covered in so much sweat that he was completely, completely drenched, right? But eventually, he stopped the carnage, like I said, eventually by himself, by his own indomitable will. And he could have easily tried to break and ran. He might have got shot in the back, but he probably could have escaped or yeah. went back. Now, he might have got attacked later. He might have got overrun. But he had the courage and the steadfastness to stay where he was and, and to hold that position. When it was over, he's still looking around, and he doesn't know what to do because he's a corporal, right? He's not a... Uh, a sergeant or anything. So he goes, well, I, I guess no one's coming. So he ends up walking back and, and uh, wa starts to pass these, these American soldiers that are retreating. And he, he gets to his unit and everybody's shocked. They, they're looking at him like he's a ghost. They didn't expect him to ever come back, you know? Yeah. So he demands, I want to see the CO. I want to see the first sergeant. So they take him to him and he tells them, they go, what happened? He goes, I think I just killed a thousand gooks, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and uh, they go, you know, you're fucking nuts, you know? And he says, uh, they said, they said, what'd you do? And he said, uh, he said, I was stopping those gook bastards. I just killed a thousand gooks, maybe more. So they're, they're like, you're fucking nuts. So they get in the Jeeps and they drive back there. And when they see the valley floor, they, they kind of, you know, realize Holy what shit. happened and they go, oh, my God. And they told the first sergeant, they said, put him in for the Medal of Honor. And his first sergeant says, okay. And then of course he didn't fucking do it. And the, uh, the, the CO that ordered that was ended up being killed in action within a week of that. So that was going to be the witness to that. And just to give you an idea of the atrocity of this combat, that, for, for his officer to be killed within a week of that, that's how, that's how hardcore this was. Which officer, the racist one? No, 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 that, he's the NCO. The, the one uh, that recommended The him. one that recommended him, just to show you how bad things were. Um, but he killed hundreds of people single-handedly. Hundreds of North Korean soldiers he was able to hold this ground. Again, they offered him... Hey, 
you know, you're, you've been recommended for this medal. You can go back to Japan and recuperate, or you can go back to the rear. And he says, no, I want to stay with my guys. So they put him back with his guys, and he um, was in shock for weeks. He was just kind of wandering around, <laughs> lost yeah. and gazed. And some of his buddies said he just kind of wasn't the same. He was... Um, off a little bit you know he was shook up by why, by what he had gone through yeah kind of went back to business as usual though his uh, first sergeant started harassing him again in uh, uh september 5th 1950 the fortunes of war had changed the we had landed on unchan they we started pushing north so now they find themselves at a place called unsan which is far into north korea so we went back from this rear guard stalling action all the way up north taibor continues to fight heroically um in one instance his um First sergeant uh, sends a patrol out, and they got hit. Six guys get killed immediately. One goes down. Tybor makes it back, and they go, all right, we're moving out. And he, Tybor says, no, I think one of those guys is still alive. And they go, he's dead. Shut the hell up. And he goes, he's still alive. So Tybor goes back by himself. He crawls out under fire. He drags the guy off the trail, carries him like a piggyback, and runs him back to the lines. On another occasion, they and sent he was him. alive? Yeah, he was alive. Jesus. On another occasion, they sent him to uh, scout um, a wood line and he, when he went in he started seeing the North Koreans and he goes oh shit you know there's a bunch of them there's not a lot of me so he decides to kind of hide and fill it out and then he looks for a little longer and they're waving a white flag so he goes and he negotiates a surrender with them he tells them he's Major Rubin even though he's only a corporal and he ends yeah. up accepting the surrender of hundreds of North Korean soldiers and again he walks back to the lines and he goes I just captured a hundred gooks and they go what are you talking about and they go in and sure enough he had captured all these guys at this point um, in a Toward the, towards the end of 1950, the war seems like it's winding down. We're almost all the way to China. You know, it seems like it's victory. They're saying we're going to be home by Thanksgiving. We're going to be home by Christmas. But then China crosses the border. And, and we've mentioned this before. So the, the fortunes of war change. November 1st, the Chinese units attack. Um, no, I'm sorry, November, 19, November 1st, 1959, they find themselves in this battle in Unsan. They get attacked by these overwhelming numbers. So he's in the same kind of firefight like he was before. The, the night opens up, the shrill of the bugles. The, the grenades start going off, the explosions, everything. There's just chaos everywhere. So these guys start fighting. Tibor's uh, watching. He's firing his rifle, and he looks, and there's a machine gun. The only thing that's holding these soldiers back is this machine gun that's firing. As he's watching, the machine gunner gets hit in the head and killed. So the assistant gunner jumps up on it. The, uh, the machine gunner. Oh, okay. So the machine gunner goes down. So the assistant machine gunner grabs the machine gun, and he's immediately killed too. So all these, the, our line starts to break and to fall back and to retreat because that's the only thing holding it. But anytime someone touches this machine gun, they get killed immediately. So, of course, uh, there's no one else to man it. So Tybor crawls over bodies. Tybor runs, and he grabs onto that machine gun, that 30 cal, and he starts holding over waves after waves of bodies again. So on this day, uh, he ended up holding that, holding that weapon for hours, he fired until he was out of ammunition. As the enemy ta uh, tanks and artillery came through, the perimeter ended up breaking. American soldiers had to start falling back, but Tybor was able to, s to stay on the gun until he was hit by a grenade and shrapnel. Jeez. He ended up getting seriously wounded in the leg, seriously wounded in the arms, and he had sh shrapnel throughout his body. Hey, guys. I hope you've been enjoying the story of Tybor Rubin. Because Tybor's story is so extraordinary, we have to spread it into two episodes. Please stay tuned for next episode where we're going to go into Tybor's experience as a POW in a North Korean and Chinese prisoner of war camp. Continue to hear the extraordinary story of a Hungarian boy who became a man, became an American, and became a Medal of Honor recipient.